Shocking videos have always captured people's attention, so much that some websites have been created exclusively to share them. While many are on the lighthearted side, only shocking insofar as how likely they are to make you vomit, some are shocking because they serve as a window into the mind of disturbed individuals and what they're willing to do. Though these often get swept up from the regular venues of video hosting platforms, it doesn't stop them from periodically resurfacing, only to remind those who watch of the dark recesses of the human mind. Today, we'll cover some of these videos and their disturbing origins. Keep in mind, this video will feature non-graphic descriptions of real crimes. I don't endorse these crimes, nor should they ever be recreated. This video is for educational and documentary purposes. If you're feeling thoughts of self-harm, please visit lifeline.org to talk to someone who can help. Born on the 29th of February 2000, Shwaib Naz Aslam, or as he eventually came to be known as Shwaibi, was a Pakistani-American teenager who struggled with mental health issues. Very little is known about Shwaibi's life before 2016 since he had almost no online activity besides his YouTube account under the name of ZL0, which was made in 2011 when he would have been 11 years old. When examined, his channel had nothing particularly strange, as Shwaibi appeared to be a run-of-the-mill, extremely online teenager of the mid-2010s. One of his more noticeable traits was his penchant for anime, given how many channels he was subscribed to whose content revolved entirely around it. In early 2016, he created an account on My Anime List, which now sits inactive, recording a total of 301 completely watched anime series. While that may pale in comparison with many people's records, it goes to show how intrinsic anime was to Shuaib. His Reddit account, which was created in the middle of 2015, also reflected that it was his primary pastime, as most of his posts and comments are anime-related, with many having Shuaib go back and forth on fan arts of Vocaloid covers. In response to a thread on r slash anime that asked users why they watch anime, Shuaib replied, to survive. In all likelihood, everyone who saw that comment at the time considered it a joke. Little did they know what kind of dire straits he found himself in. Rarely did it manifest publicly, besides the odd comment wherein he identified himself as awkward, socially autistic, and a below-average guy. But Shuaib was in anguish. Without mentioning when it began, his family described him as someone who suffered from depression and often felt feelings of worthlessness, though he was very very open about it to his family, which is an unusual characteristic of people in his position. His family did what they could to assure him he was worthy of being alive, and that doing something drastic over how he felt was a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Given his response to it and how open he was about it all, they believed he was improving, or at least not in immediate danger. Other than his family, Shwaibi also confided in his friends, seemingly to a much greater degree, which is customary for young people with this kind of problem. In text messages, he exchanged with one of his friends who also frequented the R9K4 4chan board. He speaks about his experience in school and potentially going to college as his parents were requesting him to do so, saying, School was suffering. I assume college is the same. Except now, you're paying for it. I don't want to go. If I go and hate it, I'll do something bad. Then I'd be in jail or dead. I promise to get more than two. While this not-so-subtle remark may seem like the kind of thing a 4chan user would say without putting much stock behind it, Schweibe supposedly sent this same friend quotes and excerpts from Elliot Rogers' manifesto, saying how much he identified with with him and how much they had in common. For the unaware, Elliot Roger was a 22-year-old man living in Isla Vista, California. After publishing a manifesto outlining his views on the world, struggles with women, and general dissatisfaction, he went on a violent rampage where he took the lives of six people and injured 14 others. He has since become somewhat of a meme and icon in image board culture. It was clear that this obsession was deep-rooted, and Schweibe had already spent years feeling that way. Though it's very difficult to confirm their legitimacy beyond the shadow of a doubt, someone claiming to be a friend of Schweibe shared a series of messages exchanged in 2018, wherein he retells a dream he had two years prior. This dream, which Schweibe himself calls his wildest fantasy coming true, consisted of a prolonged detailed narrative about himself miraculously finding weapons in the bathroom during a break period and proceeding to use them on everyone in his school. Despite the story beginning with him gazing at his own physical flaws in the mirror, it doesn't seem to be very relevant to his final decision. Instead, it seems much more likely that the reason behind this fantasy is directly linked to the expectation expectations that people, particularly his family, had about his academic performance, as he cathartically mentions that he has the worst grade compared to everyone he harms in his fantasy, concluding the story with, I'll never be as intelligent as them, but I know for the rest of my probably short-lived life that you don't need to be intelligent to be satisfied with a job well done. The pleasure I felt doing that can't be described in words. 
Regardless of how cringeworthy some parts, if not all, of this fantasy may be, the main thing to take away is that this was a genuine desire of his that he, at the time, took seriously. Whereas he felt powerless when it came to being a good student that would seamlessly transition from high school to college, his mind went to this scenario as the solution to it, and his attachment to the feeling of power he imagined this would give him made it so that even his closest friends had a hard time dissuading him from it. Eventually, and luckily, his plan was foiled, though it's unsure what exactly this means other than him saying that he was caught. Certainly, it has something to do with his parents parents, as according to him, neither of them trusted him anymore. However, just because he had given up on hurting other people did not mean Schweibe had gotten better. In a conversation he was having on Discord, a friend of his said, Every year, we have a house dinner. The entire dorm has this fancy-ish dinner. I hate this so much. If I went ahead with what I'm planning to do, I wouldn't have to go through that. Why am I such a coward? In reply, for once, Schweibe played the role of a more reasonable counterpart, saying, It's because you know, deep down, that's not the answer to your problems. I know this too, yet I still want it. We're not meant to be happy but maybe we can manage with just being neutral. Unfortunately, this sentiment didn't stand up to scrutiny for very long. After exchanging his last few text messages with his friends, he decided to start a call with them, and when a couple joined, he asked them to start recording and whether or not they could hear him. His friends complied, though at least one of them was profusely crying and asking Shuaib to not do what he was planning to do. Due to his nonchalant attitude and even occasional laughs, one of his friends thought it was a troll. Tragically, it wasn't, and their requests for him to reconsider it were to no avail. Shuaib had with him a sign that said, Goodbye R9K, in reference to the 4chan board he frequented most. This sign also had the date of March 14th, 2018. Another note he had said goodbye to his mom and asked her not to let the kids see any of it. Besides the recording, he also started a live stream on his YouTube channel simply titled, Hey. He was wearing a mask and a beanie, and behind him, he had hung up a blue tarp, presumably to prevent the spread of debris. About six minutes into the recording, Schweibe showed that despite having lost the trust of his parents, he hadn't lost access to what he needed in order to do what his friends feared he ultimately would. The blast knocked over the tarp and the camera, and the recording went on and his friends expressed their despair over what had just happened. A little later, it became exponentially worse as his mom walked into the room and immediately began crying, only to lift up the tarp and scream in horror. Given that his untimely passing was broadcasted directly to those on the 4chan boards he frequented, it was picked up as a topic almost immediately. While most grieved and lamented the facts that a young person like Shuaib ended the way he did, a rumor was quickly spread about him regarding another situation that I already covered on my main channel and interviewed the main quote-unquote organizer of on my second channel. The post in question basically claims that what Schweib did was in some way related to him being dissatisfied with the results of HRT. People speculated he'd done it due to the pressure of being blackmailed by R9K's femboy cult. Neither of these things are true, nor were many of the other rumors that popped up, such as him having done this because of a breakup, or that R9K had driven him to this in some other way. In reality, he just had poor mental health. All of this was eventually revealed by one of Schweib's friends, who made a thread on R9K and posted an unforeseen image of him to prove his authenticity. One of the consequences of what had happened was that R9K moderators banned Discord threads. The news of Shuai's passing was covered in a few other outlets, but to this day, not much is known about what exactly led him to his final decision. A memorial page was put up by his family to mourn him, and to this day, a story stands as a grim reminder of how disaffected even the most seemingly common people can be as a consequence of mental health issues. Steve Steffens was a 37-year-old African-American man who lived in Cleveland, Ohio. Being the nephew of a local reverend, Steve lived most of his life as a regular, well-behaved citizen. Besides a dozen or so traffic tickets from the late 90s and early 2000s, Steve had no criminal record to speak of. As a child, he lived with his sister, brother, and mother on East 85th Street, and according to his neighbors, there were no signs of dysfunction coming from his family. Steve himself, whose nickname in the neighborhood was Smokey, was described as someone who never even got angry, let alone be aggressive towards someone else. As a a teenager, he mostly kept to himself, though people began to notice certain unusual mannerisms from him. One of the things he was known to do was walk around the street with his pet python around his neck, and though it's unsure why exactly he did this, some recall it was a party trick to attract women. One specific neighbor of his was allegedly approached by Steve multiple times, with him telling her that he always had a crush on her and that he wanted her to be his queen, but to no avail, as she described him as unattractive despite his nice personality. Usually, after leaving his mother's house, Steve was seen stopping by neighborhood kids, only to tell them to stay out of trouble, go to school, and not be knuckleheads. At least, that's what most people knew him to be like. While the majority of his acquaintances thought him to be awkward but ultimately harmless, a small minority got a glance at Steve's darker side, which also happened to revolve around the pets he kept. One neighbor said this about Steve in his teen years. That kid was not normal from the beginning. He was in his early teens when the family moved in, and I was in my late 20s, but I could see something wasn't right. He was smart, but some days he seemed okay with talking to people on the street, and then other days he was staring off into space with a blank face. 
He was very up and down. He asked me to come in and see his pet bird, so I went to their house. He had a parakeet, and he had that bird crawl from the cage and onto his finger. Then he slapped the bird as hard as he could with his other hand, and the bird was lying on the floor. The bird looked dead to me. I looked at him, and he was smiling and laughing as he looked at me and that bird. Hey, animals don't make you weird like that. He was that way before he got that bird. Heard he used to torture other pets he had. He was like that from the time I first met him. Besides what his neighbors remember, very little is known about Steve's early life. As a young adult, he graduated from Myers College, a business school that shut down not long after Steve graduated from it in 2002. During his time there, he was a member of the Omega Psi Phi fraternity, and though he didn't stay in touch with his fellow fraternity members after graduation, he was remembered fondly by them as someone who was always laughing and making other people laugh, even if he was a tad awkward. While it's unknown what Steve did immediately after graduating, he eventually found steady employment as a case manager at Beach Brook, a behavioral health agency in the vicinity of Cleveland. In 2008, he joined an agency to be a youth mentor for teenagers and eventually became a vocational specialist for the Assertive Community Treatment Team, which targeted older teens and young adults. As far as jobs go, while this probably wasn't the most profitable career he could have gone for, it was one where he could realistically do a lot of good for his community. A few years went by where and little worth noting took place, and then we get to 2014, when Steve began dating a woman named Joy Lane. Joy, who also went by the last name Carr, also worked at Beachbrook as a case manager and therapist. Presumably, that's how the two met and began talking. While Steve only had his Myers College diploma, Joy had many academic achievements, including a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and Criminal Justice, as well as a Master of Science degree in Social Administration. In 2014, in conjunction with her work at Beachbrook, Joy became a part of the adjunct faculty at Cleveland State University. Later on, in 2016, she got yet another job as clinical supervisor at Murtis Taylor Human Services System. On top of all that, Joy was also a veteran that had previously served in the United States Air Force. Joy's continuous development possibly was one of the things that aggravated Steve, who by contrast grew increasingly stagnant and dysfunctional in his personal life. While Joy was seeking growth in her career, unbeknownst to most people, Steve was trying to take a shortcut to financial success via gambling. This meant that most, if not all, of the money he made from Beach Brook, which wasn't that much in the first place and came just a couple thousand shy of 30 grand annually, was being streamlined into paying his gambling debts to the neglect of every other bill he was supposed to pay. As early as 2012, Steve was being sued for unpaid credit card debt and his wages began being garnished, so he had even less available income to work with. Three years later, Steve filed for bankruptcy, declaring over $35,000 worth of debt. $21,000 of it came from an unpaid loan he took out to purchase his Dodge Charger, a little over five grand were student loans, and the rest was split between credit card debt and payday loans he never paid back. On top of all of that, he only had $350 to his name. Just a few months after he was discharged for bankruptcy, Steve started a YouTube channel called Triple Jointed TV. Many of the videos in it feature him fishing, with some odd uploads wherein he gave bowling tutorials or celebrated the victory of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Whether he made the YouTube channel in the hopes of monetizing it to pay off his debt or just to have some fun is unknown, but it quickly went inactive. Also in 2016, he created a Twitter account by the handle of StevieSteve45, which eerily foreshadowed the later events in his life. Another year went by and it was clear that the bankruptcy did nothing to curtail his addiction to gambling as he continued to rack up debt. In one of his videos from 2016, Steve mentions being at the casino, meaning he was definitely gambling again. A little later on in the same year, he was evicted from his apartment due to his failure to pay rent, only for the eviction claim to be dropped in favor of further garnishing Steve's debt to the tune of $1,800 to cover what he owed. Five months later, he got evicted once more from another apartment, though nothing indicates any of these punitive consequences prevented him from continuing to gamble away every single penny he had left. Over the course of their relationship, Steve behaved very well towards Joy and her children, despite the obvious downward spiral he found himself falling into with his addiction to gambling. She remembered him as loving and caring, but beneath the surface, his mental health issues were reaching a boiling point. It all came to a head on April 14th, 2017, when, after a period wherein the couple slowly distanced themselves from one another, as Joy took issue with Steve's gambling debt, which was becoming impossible to conceal as he was being evicted from his apartments, the two broke up. As they mutually decided to part ways, Steve said he was going to quit his job at Beach Brook and leave the state of Ohio altogether. While this was a radical move in and of itself, it was nothing compared to what Steve would actually go on to do. Over the next couple of days, Steve's mental health was free-falling. Now that he had lost one of the last bastions of normalcy in his life, as he was no longer interacting with Joy and her kids, there was nothing to hold back the impulses he'd struggled diligently to repress. He did try to talk to his mother about how he felt, but according to him, it didn't go well, as she either didn't understand what he was talking about, or to him, it seemed like she didn't care. 
filled with frustration and anger, he began to make bizarre posts on his Facebook page, such as, Facebook, my life for the past year has been really screwed up. I lost everything I ever had due to gambling at the Cleveland Jack Casino and Erie Casino. I'm not going to go into details, but I'm at my breaking point. Facebook, you have four minutes to tell me why I shouldn't be on death row. I'm dead serious. Hashtag Team Death Row. While the post did get some shocked reactions and comments attempting to dissuade Steve from whatever he was planning to do, it didn't work. His Facebook posts on the 16th of April quickly developed from suggesting and threatening to claiming he had already killed multiple people. One of the first videos he posted during his breakdown has been transcribed and heavily redacted, as it seems to have been content ID'd on YouTube and is pretty difficult to find unedited. In it, Steve was sitting in his car in front of Murtis Taylor, the social service agency where Joy worked at. He proceeded to say, What's up, everybody? The love of my life works here. Her name is Joy Lane. We've been together for three years. We were supposed to get married, but I just couldn't deal with her anymore. More. But anyway, she's the reason why I'm making this video, and she's the reason for what's about to happen today, because she drove me crazy. But, you know, anyway, I work at Beachbrook, and Beachbrook is another reason why I'm going crazy. This is my badge here. That's me. I'm just making this to say screw Beachbrook and Murtis Taylor. This past year has been really screwed up for me. Being with Joy, she drove me crazy. She started making me gamble, and I lost everything. I lost everything I had. I don't have anything. I'm out of options. So what I'm gonna do is, because she works over here at Murtis Taylor, I'm I'm going to try to take out as many people as I can over here. And it's screwed up too, because I've never really been on no sucker stuff like this. But we're all human, and I guess we all got breaking points. I went to my mother's yesterday, and I was trying to talk to my mother, but I guess it was the way I was raised. She didn't care. I was telling my mother, I was thinking about doing something drastic. Didn't care. People come at me with their problems. I'm a case manager at Beachbrook. I deal with people's problems every day, but when it comes to my stuff, nobody cares. It's like I'm always the bad guy. It doesn't matter what I do. People always take it out on me. This is screwed up because innocent people are about to die today. Hopefully, I'm going to be on death row, whatever the case may be. I just don't care anymore. I'm beat. I'm tired. I will say this, though. The people I'm going to hurt today, they're not my first. I got a few people that are over here. The street is 108th and Cedar. It's an abandoned house. I kind of lost count, honestly. It's a purple and gold church. I don't know the name of the street, but it's in a back house there. Let's see. Also, 42nd and Payne. I got somebody there. I mean, that doesn't matter because I didn't keep score, but I'm going to keep score today. But yeah, I'm about to have me some fun, I guess. And this is weird because like I said, I've never been on no sucker shit like this. I'm going to target whoever until I get caught. I'll make some more videos later, but it is what it is. Steve Steffens, 37. The thing that's about to happen in the next few minutes, you can blame it on Joy Lane. It's all her fault. My mother too. Put her in there. Maggie Steffens or Maggie Green, she goes by. It's her fault too, because she's the one who created this monster that I am. Yeah, so between the two. I'll see you in a minute. His extremely calm demeanor and casual language are very unsettling, considering the subject matter of the video. While the police later reported they found no evidence he had already harmed anyone at this point, it's very strange that he mentioned these specific places, especially since there's no place in Cleveland that matches the second location he mentions. Regardless, he went on to make yet another post, saying, Easter Day because of Joy Lane. Tell my boss I won't be coming in tomorrow. I'm sorry, team, but I'm too far gone. Zeta Omega, I really screwed up. I killed 12 people today. I won't stop until my mother and Joy Lane call me. I'm the hashtag good guy. Attached to this post were his cell phone number and many of his Facebook friends whom he tagged, but most importantly, a recording of a live stream he had recently done. Though the video cannot be found in its entirety on YouTube due to its graphic nature, cut versions are still up. It starts out with Steve in his car, which he was likely living out of at this point. As he continues his deranged ramblings, blaming Joy and his mom for his downfall, he stops abruptly and says he found a target. This person was 74-year-old father of 10, Robert Lee Godwin Sr. Godwin had just left his girlfriend's house as she was preparing their lunch for Easter and decided to take a walk and pick up some cans, which was a hobby of his. He was suddenly accosted by Steve, who asked him to say Joy Lane. Confused, Godwin complied but said he didn't know anyone by that name. Steve proceeded to say, she's the reason why this is about to happen to you, before taking his life. He continued to lie stream nonchalantly, taking phone calls from his friends and viewers of the stream, then proceeding to reiterate his claim of having hurt 13 people, a number which eventually went up to 15, though the only confirmed one as of today was Robert Godwin. The live stream recording stayed up for a few hours on Facebook until the site's moderation caught wind of it and took it down. A manhunt instantly began that spanned from Ohio to Pennsylvania. The uproar to catch Steve before he could harm more people was so great that the FBI got involved, putting up a reward of $50,000 for his arrest 
arrest. The police even managed to get in touch with him via phone call once, but he refused to turn himself in. In the meantime, Joy took to Facebook to update people, saying she was safe and with the police, and asking that her and her children's privacy not be violated. Shortly after, though, she deleted her Facebook account. The following day was mostly silent, though the police received over 400 tips, including some from Pennsylvania. Two days after, around 11 a.m., Steve pulled up to a McDonald's drive-thru in Erie, PA, and ordered 20 chicken McNuggets and a basket of fries. Presumably, this is how he'd been sustaining himself over the previous days. Fortunately, the attendant noticed who he was and decided to call the cops and inform them of his whereabouts while telling Steve he would have to wait a little longer for his fries to be ready. He picked up on this being a tactic to stall him so that the cops could arrive and decided to speed away with his McNuggets. However, it was too late, as they were already on their way and a pursuit began. The car chase ended as fast as it started, with a police car successfully doing a pit maneuver on Steve's, which began spinning out of control. In the resulting chaos, Steve realized that no matter what he did from that point onward, he would be caught and arrested. While his car was still out of control, Steve took his own life, putting a tragic end to an already tragic story. Despite all of this, Joy Lane still remembered Steve for the guy he used to be when he was with her, instead of the guy he was on Facebook in his last days. Even after his passing, she continued to receive harassment from people online who blamed her for what Steve had done. However, Godwin's family themselves never blamed her and saw Steve as solely responsible for his actions. To this day, Robert Godwin is dearly missed by his family. Few crimes have ever received as much coverage as the attack on Columbine High School by Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Often featured in the media about them are images such as this picture and these images, which some people are unaware actually came from a set of home videos the duo made prior to their heinous crime. Both Harris and Klebold were enrolled in classes that involved producing videos, and since they were familiar with and had access to recording equipment, they decided to record some videos of their own for fun. Of the totality of these recordings, only two tapes were ever fully released, namely Hitman for higher and rampart range, while the rest of them either saw a very partial release or only made it to the public in the form of transcripts. A lot of the footage was purposely kept from the eyes of the public because the authorities feared it would inspire other disaffected teenagers to follow in the duo's footsteps. Eventually, in 2011, the tapes were supposedly destroyed, though many people speculate this was claimed exclusively to curtail people's requests for their release. The first tape we'll talk about is titled Hitmen for Hire. Recorded in December 1998, the tape begins with neither Eric nor Dylan visible in the shot but presumably another student who was helping them out by playing a part in their video. This person was set to play the role of a bullied student who needed help to deal with bullies, and promptly, as they asked for it, the camera panned down the hallway, where from its end, Dylan and Eric came out, walking menacingly toward the camera in their trench coats. While the tone of the video is very much one of play acting, it foreshadows what they later came to do, almost as if this was some kind of morbid rehearsal. As they walk toward the camera, a few people can be seen in the back also coming through the same place they walk from, only to notice a recording was going on and immediately run back, having little to no idea what the context of it was. As the two make their way to the bullied student, they offer their help in exchange for a cost. This is because, despite not actually being members of it, Eric and Dylan were pretending to be members of the Trenchcoat Mafia, a loosely associated group of Columbine students who banded together over their interest in video games like Doom and being harassed by the more popular students. While it could be said that Eric and Dylan tentatively do fit the bill, at least on the Doom part, they were only friends with some of the members, but were never members themselves, as the yearbook picture including all of them visibly did not include either of the perpetrators. The following scene involved Eric and Dylan doing their best to creatively shout threats to the camera, though Dylan messes up and starts laughing midway through. If they weren't, well, who they were, you could easily think this is an attempt at a comedy skit. Right after, a very similar setup to the first scene takes place, this time outside of the school, and culminating in Harris and Klebold taking aim at a supposed bully, immediately succeeded by multiple different shots of them popping fireworks and shooting an airsoft at him. The rest of the footage is mostly uneventful, containing little besides recreations of the same scenes in different settings, always following the pattern of a victim of a bully negotiating a deal for their protection, followed by the bully either being threatened or punished in some fashion. It's pretty grim that they were already comfortable enough with the concept to play around with it in these videos. The other tape that was released is one dubbed Rampart Range, which runs for almost 15 minutes. Unlike Hitmen for Hire, which was recorded in late 1998, this video was filmed much closer to the date of their crime, just over a month prior, on March 6, 1999. In it, we can see Eric and Dylan armed with the same weaponry they'd later go on to use. Though we don't know exactly who was holding the camera during the Hitmen for Hire video, we do know some of the people present, like an employee at Rampart Range, along with a female friend of his. Obviously, the people who participated in the recording of the video had no idea of the duo's ultimate intentions with what they had purchased. The video is titled Rampart Range after the actual firing range they were at during the recording, which was relatively close to their high school. 
They were also still dressed up in the same trench coat attire, which given the context of the video made them look like oversized children, excited to be playing with something dangerous. Throughout the video, they can be seen repeatedly trying to hit targets and failing to do so because they insisted to aim from the hip, which also often resulted in their hands hurting, which they then tried to play off. While the tone of this video was lighter than that of Hitmen for Hire, it's still pretty off-putting to see the kind of artillery they had access to, considering the dysfunctional mental states they were in. For most of the tape's duration, they varied from excitedly fantasizing about what they planned, to joking about it in a fashion that severely downplayed it, possibly to avoid suspicion from the people that were there during the filming, or perhaps because they just genuinely found it really funny. Besides comparing what they were doing to Doom in the movie Terminator, in one particular moment, the duo begins ironically parodying those who advocate against the right to bear arms. It's alarming how jovial they seemed in the lead-up to what they did, but more important and informative than the tapes that were released were the ones that remained out of sight. While we have no footage of it, we do have transcripts that were made available primarily through Time Magazine. Besides their journals, these videos are some of the most revealing pieces of Columbine media as far as understanding the mindset they had leading up to April 20th. The tapes were separated into five different pieces of evidence, each recorded on a different date. The first one is dated to the 15th of March, a little over a week after the recording of Rampart Range. The duo is seen drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels and discussing how they want the whole world to see these videos when their masterpiece is done. In reference to the people they manipulated in order to get what they needed to carry out the masterpiece, Dylan said, We used them. They had no clue. Don't blame them. And don't arrest them. Don't arrest any of our friends or family members or our co-workers. Don't arrest anyone because they don't have a clue. If it hadn't been them, it would have been someone else over 21. Eric then tells an anecdote about how his dad almost found out that he had ordered some equipment to prepare for the crime because he had ordered it in his dad's name instead of his own to avoid drawing attention. The motivations behind the attack enter the conversation, and Eric complains about his dad causing his family to move five times, which severely damaged his ability to establish himself socially in school. He proceeds to mention people making fun of him, which piqued Dylan's attention, who added how his older brother, who was athletic, mocked him, saying, You made me what I am, you added to the rage. After essentially blaming everything they wanted to do on other people being mean to them in one way or another, they get to talking about the other close calls they've had with being caught. Dylan mentions a moment in which his parents walked in on him trying on the trench coat, which, unbeknownst to them, concealed a weapon. Eric then recalls how his mom thought that the barrel sticking out of his gym bag was an airsoft, almost gloating about how easy it was to get away with what he was doing, saying, I could convince them that I'm going to climb Mount Everest or that I have a twin brother growing out of my back. I can make you believe anything. They go over specific students they intend to target before joking about rooting for the Romans to crucify Jesus to spite the Christians in their high school. A little further in the footage, the camera is covering Eric's gloves, which he took from a doctor's office, so that he could wear them while preparing the more volatile parts of his plan. The rest of the scenes during this part of the tape are just them documenting all the gear they've accumulated. Eventually, it cuts to Eric's basement bedroom, where he begins to deliver a monologue. Do not think we're trying to copy anyone. We had the idea before the first one ever happened. Our plan is better. Not like those guys in Kentucky with camouflage. Those kids were only trying to be accepted by others. We need a kickstart. If we have a religious war or oil or anything, we need to get a chain reaction going here. It's gonna be like doom. Tick, 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 tick. Go ahead and change laws. How do you think we got ours? I hope you get an idea of what we're implying here. We need to kickstart the revolution here. Dylan replies saying, the most casualties in US history. We're hoping. I hope we take 250 of you. It will be the most nerve-wracking 15 minutes of my life. After everything is set and we're waiting to charge through the school, seconds will feel like hours. I can't wait. I'll be shaking like a leaf. Imagining what his parents would say, Dylan sarcastically says, if only we could have reached them sooner or found this tape, before Eric resumes, if only we could have searched their room, if only we could have asked the right questions. I'm really sorry about all this. My parents might have made some mistakes that they weren't really aware of. It's when Eric makes a small detour to display a modicum of empathy that Dylan ramps up the disc course. Directors will be fighting over this story. I know we're going to have followers because we're so godlike. We're not exactly human. We have human bodies, but we've evolved into one step above you. We actually have self-awareness. The tape ends as the two argue over who should direct the movie about what they'll do. The next tape begins three days after the first one, and it mostly consists of the two discussing what they idealize to be the aftermath of their actions. However, the footage is punctuated with some interesting moments, such as the two theorizing that when the police manage to find these videos, they will only show certain parts 
parts of it in order to control the narrative of the event, which is curious considering this tape's transcript was published against the wishes of the police. Besides this, they also go on rants about how religion is gay and for weak people who can't deal with life, as well as a couple of racist tirades against black people and Hispanics before the footage runs out. The following tape is dubbed Reb's Tape, Reb being Eric Harris's nickname. In it, there's a scene wherein Eric is alone, being candid for once about how hard it has been on him to prepare for the shooting. He says, My parents are the best parents I've ever known. My dad is great. I wish I was a sociopath so I didn't have any remorse, but I do. This is going to tear them apart. They'll never forget it. There's nothing you guys could have done to prevent any of this. There's nothing that anyone could have done to prevent this. No one is to blame except me and Dylan. Our actions are a two-man war against everyone else. However, this humanizing moment quickly comes to an end as Harris discusses titling his notebook, where he's doing all of the planning for the shooting, The Writings of God. As he shows the drawings he has on it, the tape comes to an end. It's unknown whether Eric purposely cut moments like this short because they made him feel uncomfortable, or if he genuinely couldn't maintain human emotion for very long. In another tape from the same time period where the two discuss and show off more gear they'd gotten, there's a brief moment where Eric mentions wishing he could have visited his friends in Michigan one last time, and appears to shed a tear about it before the camera shuts off. The last recording ever made by them took place about 30 minutes before their attack on April 20th, 1999. It begins with both of them already dressed up, and Dylan begins the talk. Hey mom, gotta go. It's about half an hour before our little judgment day. I just wanted to apologize to you guys for any crap this might instigate. Just know I'm going to a better place. I didn't like life too much, and I know I'll be happy wherever I go. So I'm gone. Goodbye. Dylan then takes the camera and begins filming for Eric, who also delivers his goodbye message. Everyone I love, I'm really sorry about this. I know my mom and dad will be just shocked beyond belief. I'm sorry, all right? I can't help it. Morris, Nate, if you guys live, I want you guys to have whatever you want from my room and the computer room. Susan, sorry. Under different circumstances, it would have been a lot different. That's it. Sorry. Goodbye. Given how genuinely reluctant they seem to be on the eve of acting out their plan, one must wonder how different things could have been if their concern for how their loved ones would feel translated into a change in their actions. Unfortunately, this wasn't how things went down, and just half an hour later, one of the most tragic and gruesome events in history began, claiming the lives of 15 people, including that of Eric and Dylan, who, when realizing they were about to be taken down by the cops, decided to join their victims. Ricardo Lopez was born on January 14th, 1975, and moved to the United States from Montevideo, Uruguay as a young child. He grew up in a middle-class suburban area in the southeast of Georgia in a town called Lawrenceville. Throughout his life, Ricardo led a relatively ordinary existence with no criminal record and just one psychiatric contact due to his anxiety. Due to his childhood, he struggled with Klinefelter syndrome, a genetic disorder that causes, among many other things, hypogonadism, testicular atrophy, and gynomastasia. This condition, combined with him being over overweight contributed to his profound insecurity and feelings of inadequacy, particularly in a sexual context. Despite being an intelligent person, Ricardo struggled with studying and finding employment due to his persistent feelings of extreme inadequacy. Furthermore, for the most part, he lacked a social life and never had any romantic relationships, which further intensified his sense of being unfit. Upon reaching the age of 18, Ricardo relocated to Florida, where he landed a job as a bug exterminator at a pest control company run by his brother. With the income he earned, he managed to live independently in a small apartment in Hollywood, Florida. Although by this point he had a few friends and maintained a positive relationship with his family, Ricardo was still very introverted. His isolation, combined with the absence of affection in his life, gradually caused him to detach from society. The dreams he once held of leading a normal life and finding a romantic partner slowly faded away. To escape his reality, Ricardo immersed himself in celebrity gossip and the lives of actors and international music stars. He began fantasizing about becoming a famous artist himself and attending art school, so much so that he eventually dropped out of high school in the hopes of potentially pursuing a career as an artist. Unbeknownst to those around him, there was also a darker side to his fantasies. Of such a violent nature, no one could even imagine it would come from Ricardo. Approximately a year later, Ricardo commenced writing a diary, which ultimately spanned over 800 pages. Within these pages, he expressed his distorted and despondent thoughts, usually revolving around his deep-seated self-esteem issues. This diary eventually became a matter of contention online as people sought after it. However, after it was confirmed by a police spokesperson that it had been preserved, hopes of getting direct access to his contents were dashed when further inquiries were completely ignored, resulting in it now being considered lost media. Regardless, over the years, various sex serfs from Ricardo's diary have resurfaced through media coverage of this case. Initially, Ricardo developed an unhealthy obsession with a renowned female film star in the United States that has gone unnamed. However, 
his love and admiration became disgust and anger as, right after she broke up with someone she was in a long-term relationship with, she immediately involved herself with someone else. It was only after this incident that Ricardo discovered the Icelandic artist Bjork and fell deeply in love with her, or what he perceived as love, but was in fact, another unhealthy obsession. This infatuation of his partly served as a substitute for his lack of a real-life girlfriend, but also, it provided a semblance of purpose and structure in his otherwise directionless life. He says, being in love, having an infatuation is a euphoric feeling and I was very happy. I had something to look forward to every day. Psychology professor Louis Schlesinger conducted an analysis of Ricardo's diary, revealing that throughout the diary, Ricardo referenced self-destructive thoughts over 30 times, expressed feelings of inadequacy and insecurity nearly 200 times, and mentioned Bjork an astonishing 400 times. His obsession with Bjork consumed him, leading him to extensively research her life, send numerous fan letters, and relentlessly stalk her every move. Strangely, Ricardo's fixation on Bjork seemed to transcend sexuality and romance. Instead, he longed to be a significant presence in her life, whatever he considered that to be. He got to the point of fantasizing about time traveling back to when Bjork was a child so that he could befriend her and be a part of her upbringing. He was acutely aware of the abnormality of his obsession, even referencing the Madonna whore complex in his description of it, claiming he could never have sex with her because he simply loved her too much. He confided in others about his infatuation with her, including his brother, who dismissed it as the unhealthy obsession that it was, telling him to go find a real woman. As Ricardo's worship intensified, so did his self-loathing. He described himself as a loser who never learned to drive and never experienced the embrace or love of a girl. He felt utterly alone and was deeply repulsed by his own body, even recounting an incident where someone claimed he smelled like a dog. Ricardo also began abandoning his yearnings to be an artist, saying that he was too deformed to be enrolled in art school and get formally trained. He would often create unrealistic fantasies only to beat himself up about his utter inability to achieve them. For instance, he imagined being a presenter at the MTV Awards, only to follow it up by humiliating himself for being too broke to pay rent. After a period of mindless worship of Bjork, his obsession took a dark turn for the worse when he discovered that she was romantically involved with British music producer and DJ Goldie, which Ricardo found unacceptable. From that moment on, his obsessive ramblings revolved around a desire to punish Bjork for what he perceived as a betrayal. Over the next 15 months, Ricardo stopped writing in his diary and instead began recording himself on videotapes. He made a total of 11 tapes, each approximately two hours long. During these recordings, Ricardo's appearance deteriorated as he shaved his head bald and eventually started painting his face and body half black and half red, though the reason behind this remains unknown. Initially, Ricardo's plan to exact revenge involved sending Bjork a hollowed out book filled with syringes containing AIDS, aiming to indirectly affect her life without causing her death so that he could stay with her forever in his own twisted way. However, realizing the impossibility of such a design, he settled on sending a hollowed out book containing a sulfuric acid contraption. If she survived it, she would be permanently disfigured. Although it's unclear where Ricardo acquired his knowledge to make this, what is known is that he meticulously crafted the device while listening to Bjork's music, considering himself her angel of death. Towards the end of the videotapes, he claimed to have mailed the package to Bjork's London residence, expressing fear of being apprehended and vowing to do something extreme if anyone discovered his device. After sending the package, Ricardo recorded his final video titled Last Day Ricardo Lopez. In the footage, he appeared naked, standing in front of a sign reading The Best of Me September 12th. Unseen in the shot were the words he had scribbled on another wall of his house, which read, the 8mm videos are documentation of a crime, terrorist matter, they are for the FBI. Ricardo then proceeded to shave his head and eyebrows before painting his face in red and green, examining his altered appearance in a mirror, saying, I'm definitely not drunk. I am not depressed. I know exactly what I'm doing. It's cocked back. It's ready to roll. In this segment of the video, the song I Remember You by Bjork plays, and as it concludes, Lopez loudly declares, this is for you. As soon as he fires, he immediately disappears from view, and the camera ceases recording. Four days later, an odor emanated from his apartment, leading the police to discover his body and the tapes. After confirming the absence of traps in his residence, the police swiftly took action to intercept the package Ricardo had sent to Bjork, successfully averting any harm. Although, the likelihood of Bjork being harmed by the package was already negligible since she did not open her own mail, it remains fortunate that it did not detonate, potentially endangering an unrelated innocent individual. Upon learning of Ricardo's intentions, Bjork, concerned for her own safety as well as that of her son, hired security as a precaution. To this day, these tapes serve as a stark reminder of how mental illness can lead someone to become completely mired in their insane delusions. It's unfortunate Ricardo didn't get help earlier on, as if he had experienced some sense of belonging or community, it's possible that he could have never taken his own life to begin with, and actually become a happy, fulfilled person. I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.